So it's a real opportunity to be with you here, Jim. And I, I know that I have a few minutes to discuss something that I'm very passionate about. And that is this notion of transforming, like literally transforming the narrative of mental illness. And that's my commitment and dedication to the world around me. So we're going to start a little bit with just, a, you know, to put this into just a few minutes, it's a, it's a condition that's affecting the world at a global scale. I mean, really all over the planet, not just in our particular neighborhood or our particular society or country, but really all over the world. One of the hottest topics is this notion of mental, mental illness and um, how to or if to or when to treat it. So, um, you know, this idea is, is that what really is mental illness? And that's the question that as a psychiatrist, as a psychiatrist now for a little more than 30 years and having been in the mental health field for a little more than 40 years now, I've been asking myself the whole time. So here's the deal, Jim, mental illness is simply a conversation. Now, I don't mean to disrupt anybody who's pretty certain that they have mental illness. And I don't mean to downplay any of the conditions or any of the, the experiences that people are having. But the truth is mental illness, just like anything else, gets its roots from just being a conversation. And once we treat something as simply a conversation and one that is uh, designed by the words that we choose to describe it, we can also see that the opportunity exists to transform the way we speak about something and therefore give it a new identity altogether. So let's make it clear that uncomfortable experiences actually really do occur. I mean, let's make it clear. There are things going on in the world that are unacceptable and there are people who are doing things that are essentially heinous or intolerable. There are uh, experiences going on in life that are really hard to metabolize and I'm not discounting any of those. What I am possibly saying, however, is it doesn't leave anyone pathologically ill, that all experiences that we have maybe inherently don't re represent illness. Another way to look at this, Jim, is that being satisfied with the way things are going is not synonymous with being mentally healthy. Being happy really does require a shift, a shift in being, a shift in mindset, a paradigmatic shift in context. So being uncomfortable is said another way. Being uncomfortable is not synonymous with being unhealthy. Being uncomfortable maybe even is a sign that you are very healthy. Because after all, there's many, many good reasons to be uncomfortable with the state of affairs on the international level, on the national level, on the local level, even on the internal level. So being uncomfortable might be the proper and only the only proper response to the experience of the world around us. And that would take away the notion that the discomfort, whether it be anxiety or depression or fear or hopelessness or uh, you know any type of, um, even, even feeling confused or aimless or unsteady or incomplete or, you know, like uh, disrupted or, you know, all the things that we sometimes equate, trouble sleeping or trouble being with other people. Maybe those are simply manifestations of what it is to be an actually, to be an average or even a normal human being. Now, the word that I've seen more thrown around here is the word diseased. And Instead of being diseased, we can call it diseased or out of the ease state. So here's the next question that gets aligned from this, which is what if these were not conditions per se that came out after us and then, um, and then debilitated us? What if these are actually responses and proper responses that we can make as people to the experience of the life as it occurs to us such that we can alter those experiences rather than simply react or to respond negatively. Responding in a way that leaves us feeling helpless or feeling disempowered or feeling disenfranchised. What if there was not actually a such thing as mental illness per se, that sort of, I have a condition and therefore I don't know how to do this or can't do that. What if there was just an indicator that when we were feeling uncomfortable with mental distress or mental dis or imbalance or mental dis ease, we were able to, what if we were able to look, consider looking at the world in a different way where empowerment could now 
take the space of the disempowerment that had um, that had been with us for such time, for a long time. So look, this is a short talk. And I know you might be saying, or your, your viewers might be saying, well, if you knew my condition, I mean, if you saw me, if you, Dr. Fred, this is ludicrous and you're not paying respect to the fact that I have a mental illness. If you were, if you saw me, you would see that I do. Or if you saw my sister or my mother-in-law, you would know that they were ill because after all, you know, look at them. And what I'm suggesting here is that once you make the statement that illness exists, in fact, it does exist based on the words that you describe it. So you seek out the evidence support its ongoing, uh, its ongoing perpetuation. What's possible here is that the, by getting the treatment, by making the declaration and then getting the treatment and getting the medication sometimes or whatever, there is an opportunity to perpetuate the condition into infinity and to keep with the condition as a way, maybe, just maybe, as a way of easing the pain or easing the responsibility at times for being unable to do life the way you wish you could. And so, look, we're all unable to do life the way that we wish we could. So being depressed or being anxious or being nervous or even not wanting to get out of bed or not wanting to eat or not wanting to sleep or take care of ourselves, these are actually experiences that can be altered and aren't something that is a condition that succumbs us. So, you know, we start looking at, all right, if that's the case, you know, people will fight for their mental illness. Like they will. People, when I suggest to somebody that they're normal and they don't want to be seen as normal, they will fight. They will fight to assure me and to convince me that they're abnormal. Now, what's interesting about this is that each of us deep down knows that we're abnormal. Like I know that I'm different than everybody else on the planet. And I sometimes feel really lonely and like, why am I so different? And, or why am I so abnormal? And what I'm, what I'm pointing to here is, and in order for me to call myself normal or abnormal, I would have to have a pretty good definition of what normal is. Now I've done a fair amount of studying in this, although some people have conjectured what normal is, it's never been put in, in, it's never been put in terms that are reliable, that all of society and all of humans accept, not even close. You know, there are simple explanations like what is normal? And, but generally nobody is able to give any kind of, um, any kind of actual definition that works across, across cultures or even across neighborhoods or even across family. He's abnormal, she's abnormal, there's some possibility there, but maybe that's really just a function of the observer who, when they meet somebody who falls outside of their range of what they have decided is normal, then makes the audacious statement that that person is abnormal and if there's prevailing agreement in society, it gets confirmed that that person is abnormal. And then they're treated as abnormal, they treat themselves as abnormal, and the whole thing gets a perpetuation that way. So in sort of as we wind down this talk, I wanna say something which is maybe, just maybe, maybe it's completely normal to experience knowing, I mean, to know to our, form, for, you know, to our core selves that we are abnormal. So knowing that we're abnormal is, could be a functional, like a functional key component, a foundational component of what it means to be a normal human being. And once we start getting that each and every one of us knows we're abnormal and that's just a foundational component of being human, we can start from there. We can start being compassionate with ourselves that there is no good sense of what normal or abnormal is. And I have found, Jim, that when I start treating with people, start treating people, start treating people as if they are empowered and normal, even beyond what they accept themselves to be, new miracles can arise in their life. New miracles can arise in our relationship. And all of a sudden, things that were otherwise considered unavailable become unavailable, become naturally available as a function of people being treated as if they're empowered, as if they're actually normal in their abnormal sense of self. And what becomes available is that we become a brotherhood. We become a, a race. We become a, an entity called humanity that is really not sure at all what our next step should be, really not sure at all how to go through life. 
and really working with each other to take steps forward into life that, I don't know, bring us a greater degree of satisfaction, bring, bring us a greater degree of contribution, bring us a greater degree of, of uh, you know, validity. So maybe this is just all life. And maybe we are just as abnormal as each other. And maybe we're just as normal as each other, therefore. And maybe, just maybe, there's no real entity of a thing called mental illness. And we could start from there with ourselves and others. So as it turns out, Jim, you're not ill. I'm not ill. We start here and together, these steps that we take make the whole thing worthwhile. You know, I wish you and you and your listeners or your viewers the very best on this wild, fantastic journey that includes everything from just, ex, you know, exquisite miracles to just excruciating pain. And in truth, I love all of it. If there's a way to embrace it all, well, that's, we get the experience of the whole shebang. And by saying that, by really embracing all of life, what's here is to love, love life for all that it is, bad and good, hard and, hard and easy, uh, wonderful and terrible, just as it is. And definitely get that there is no abnormal here. There is no abnormal where you are. And certainly at the very bottom, there is no apparent or obvious inherent condition known as mental illness. Am I saying something correct? Not necessarily. I'm just saying something that is compelling enough to have us get that we can start today from a space of we don't know what's going on and it's time to move forward. In some ways, it's like blaming the log for burning. As it turns out, if you put a log in a fire, it's going to burn. And if it burns, it's actually a normal log. The same holds true. We put ourselves into difficult circumstances. It's They're here to be had, whether we like it or not, in relationships, in um, you know, viewpoints and beliefs and interactions uh, with our world around us or with other people. And then we face those things without a manual, without a true honest ability. We have some guidelines, some of us use this guideline or that guideline, but in the end, all we have here is the ability to absorb what we're experiencing, to respond accordingly, and to get that we can learn from mistakes and we can learn from others we can interact with others, and in the end, we can be of service to making the whole thing uh, at least perceived as worthwhile. So that's really what I'm here to say. And I just have it that, you know, I haven't always known that this was a revolutionary way to look at things. To me, it looks like it comes from when I was, you know, four years old, and it just hasn't changed. And so I really, really want to say that, you know, if this is interesting to you, I'm curious, I'd be more than happy to speak with you. Um, my website is welcometohumanity.net and that's the name of my brand. I'm Dr. Fred, so you can find me at Dr. Fred, DR Fred at welcometohumanity.net. And uh, I'm more than interested in carrying on a conversation, more than interested in learning what's there for you. I do personal coaching, I do um, speaking engagements, I do consultations. I do some expert witness work in the, in the courtrooms, given that I have been a psychiatrist for over 30 years. And uh, I like, really like making that difference in the world. And also I've been a real ambassador for uh, telehealth for all these years as well. So I'm coaching you know, people to really walk other people off the ledge of their own mental illness or their own sense of mental illness and bringing back empowerment where disempowerment had been residing. So really transforming the narrative of mental illness on a global scale is what I'm about. And it's been a deep pleasure being here with you and a deep pleasure being able to speak you know, to my truth, be, speak to the areas of life where I can make a difference as a healer, where I can make a difference as a mental health professional, where I can make a difference as a human being with another human. I mean, after all, there's not that much be better than that. So thanks for the time, Jim. Thanks for the time on your show. And thanks for your viewers for paying any attention to anything I have to say or anyone else has to say, because what else is there to do in life? So with that, I'd like to say thanks, thanks and goodbye, you know, and uh, if there's any questions, I look forward to carrying on. Thank you, Jim.